Uh, why don't you introduce yourself, Dr. Amoro, and uh, give uh, give us a little introduction about you and your center, so we understand the, the uh, realities, like and, and limitations, and potential um, advantages of your your reality there, and then we'll then you go ahead and present the case. Okay, so my name is Dr. Jeremiah Omoro. I'm a neurosurgery resident at the University of Nairobi. Uh, this is in Kenya. It's the, the primary training facility for Masters of Medicine in Neurosurgery. It's a program that has been there for a while, graduated since uh, 2009. We've been able to graduate at least uh, seven classes. And uh, I'll be clearing my exam in the next one month, and then I'll be able to go back to my rural facility where I'll be able to practice there. Uh, the program has uh, has like ten faculty members, and uh, uh, we have we have uh, most of them have done sub specialization. We have some of them done who've done skull based surgery. Some of them have done. Uh, <coughs> I've done a spine surgery, so it's a really good program, and I've been able to to learn a lot. So we get to see most of most of our cases are pre predominantly trauma cases, but sometimes we tend to get some uh, oncology cases and uh, even spine cases. So there's a whole spectrum of cases that we tend to see in the program. Uh, we've been able to train most of the center area, most of the graduates come from Kenya, but we've also been able to train most of the guys from Africa, uh, from the East Africa, as well as all the way to the West Africa. So the program has actually trained uh, a lot of members, uh, neurosurgeons practicing in, in the country, as well as in Africa as a, as a continent. Uh, Are also, you are you from Kenya yourself or, or from somewhere else? Yes, 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 I'm from Kenya. And, and in your program, um, just to have an idea, the percentage of residents are from Kenya. How, how would you describe? Uh, uh, at least 60% of the residents in each class comes from Kenya. Mm -hmm. Then you tend to get uh, other people from other international residents Good. from other countries. Is but predominantly just from Africa. And how many per year is the program? How many are there? So, Since so in my class currently we are we are eight. Wow. Yes. Mm -hmm. would, yes, and then the next class after us is, is around five. So mm -hmm. the numbers are approximately at least five for each class, but sometimes mm -hmm. we tend to get up to eight or mm -hmm. nine. Wow. Yes. And the volume of cases, I'm sure it's it's must be huge. Yes, yes, yes. The volume of cases is huge. Very impressive. Okay. Um, and then just before we proceed, like in terms of SCOBE's uh, capacity, uh, what are the equipments that you guys have available? Like, uh, for instance, um, can you talk a little bit about like microscope and endoscopes, uh, capacity, cap or neural navigation? Um, intraoperative MRI, what, like, give us a little uh, idea, like, what are the uh, capital equipment available? So, in terms of equipment, yes, we have a Pentero 900 microscope. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a CUSA, which you tend to use with the hepatobiliary surgeons. So, it's not the ideal neurosurgical uh, CUSA, but that's what we tend to get, especially for the skull based meningiomas that. Sometimes it could be difficult to use. We we have an MRI machine. At least we have two in the National Teaching Hospital, which are working. So we tend to get to use the MRI, though we because it's used by most of the uh, patients from other departments. Then sometimes we tend to get a lot of a uh, a uh, a long booking before we get the MRIs. But the CT scan is available, and uh, at least we have also two uh, two CT scans in the in the hospital. So that's what we tend to use. We don't have an intraoperative MRI or a neural navigation. So most of the time we use our anatomy to, to locate the lesions and operate. And do you do any endoscopic endonasal approach? 
Yes, we, we use we also have endoscopic. We tend to combine with the ENT. We have some ENT surgeons who who mastered the the endoscopic anatomy. So sometimes we use them for the nasal phase. Mm -hmm. Then once we get to the sphenoidal phase, the, the neurosurgical team takes over. Okay. Well, it yes. seems a very advanced center there in Kenya. Um, any of the panelists have any question uh, to Dr. Omoro before we uh, he presents the case? Linda, it looks like you want to ask something. Oh, I just welcome Dr. Omoro. Do you have an um, ultrasound? No, we don't have an ultrasound. Okay. Yeah, I think the ultrasound, particularly the endonasal ultrasound, that is less invasive, is something new in most places. Even in America, places don't have it yet, I think. Um, okay, so uh, go ahead, uh, please, Dr. Omoro, and uh, show us the, the case and give your perspective. Thank you so much. Okay, so... I just present a brief history and physical examination. So the patient is a 28-year-old male, is a university student. He presented with a history of uh, two years of left-sided suboccipital headache with extension to the neck, slurred speech, and uh, difficulty in chewing food and blurriness of vision. Uh, he had also some swallowing difficulty, but this was more with solid meals. Uh, the semi-solid and liquid he was able to take. He had no comorbid illness and there was no history of trauma or irradiation. In physical examination, he was in fair general condition. He was alert, oriented in time, place, and person with a normal visual acuity and normal fundoscopy. And the cranial nerve assessment is noted to have a left hypoglossal nerve palsy, but the other cranial nerves are essentially normal. So I have an image you can just look at in the next slide. He had a normal motor and sensory finding and the systematic examination was, was normal. So this is just a photograph of the patient. This is what I was able to get. And you can see actually not the, the hemiatrophy of the left lung, le left uh, tongue, with deviation to the ipsilateral side, that's the left side. Uh, they also had some fasciculation, though the, 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 the intermittent, and you can actually see them on close uh, view. So I'll just present the images. These are axial cuts of the axial T1 cuts from the level of the upper med lower medulla. And you can actually see on the left side, on the left uh, side, you have an isointense ill-defined lesion that seems to be quite distant from the brain stem, from the medulla, but you can actually see it there. It has um it's abutting the cerebellar hemisphere posteriorly, and uh, as you can see on the next slide, you can actually see part of it is actually encroaching on the hypoglossal canal. So this you'll be able to see on the next scan, that is the T2 axial cut. And so on this T2 axial cut, the T1 axial cut was actually on a slightly higher level, but on this T2 cut, you can actually see it closer to the slightly lower level and actually see that it has actually abutted on the brainstem. The vertebral artery can actually, the ipsilateral vertebral artery can be noted uh, anteriorly to the lesion and seems to be abutting on the lesion. And the next scan can actually see the ipsilateral uh, petrous segment of the internal carotid artery. And actually the lesion is abutting on the internal carotid artery. And you can actually see on this T2 cut that is actually extending towards the jugular foramen on the ipsilateral side. Uh, there's no overt uh, T2 upper intensity signal on the brainstem in all the cuts. This is a coronal cut, and uh, you can actually see that the lesion is extending beyond the hypoglossal canal to the upper cervical spine. So on this second can, scan, you can actually see the occipital condyle and the contralateral side. And this is the C1 lateral mass. And you can only see the lesion is extending all the way towards the C1 lateral mass. And this is just a representation of the same uh, magnified view of the, of the image showing how the, the lesion is, has an intracranial component and across the apoglossal canal and uh, the extracranial component and uh, the characteristic dumbbell appearance. This is a sagittal cut. 
And that's why you see the lesion is actually abutting the internal carotid uh, posteriorly to it. Uh, and this extension towards the upper part of the cervical spine. This is a axial post contrast scan. You can see the heterogeneous contrast enhancement of the lesion. And so on the report that the, the, on the report from the MRI, I'll say that the lesion is left sided, hypoglossal canal expands a lesion that was dumbbell shape. It was heterogeneously enhancing. And in terms of size, it was 20.4 millimeters on an AP orientation. It was 26.1 on transverse and 23.4 millimeters on a cranio 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 caudal uh, measurement. So our chief differential diagnosis for this lesion was actually a hypoglossal uh, schwannoma. So the questions to the panel that we had was, what would be the approach to this lesion? And uh, what would be the surgical nuances to resection of the lesion, especially for us residents from uh, who want, really want to learn how to approach this calbus lesion. And then uh, what would be the role of now reconstruction in such a case? And probably I'll ask the, the panel if they have an experience with the nerve reconstruction for such lesions. Thank you. Ex excellent, uh, Dr. Moro. Maybe uh, just leave it there for, I'm sure some of the panelists would like to look at the imaging again. Um, okay. So it's not a not a simple case. I've got to say that. So um, um, let's uh, start uh, hearing the panel here. I'll I'll wait to give my opinion. Uh, let's see uh, with Dr. Oya uh, from Japan. What 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 are your thoughts, yeah. uh, Suichi? Okay, uh, I think this is uh, moderate size uh, hypogrossal schwannoma. So we're uh, yeah, uh, I would basically perform the surgery in the transcondylar approach settings, exposing the uh, left side of the C1 lamina to the lateral side, namely to the uh, C1 lateral mass. The uh, hypogrossal canal, uh, which is already enlarged by the tumor itself, and it's ident it should, should be identified and uh, removed the intracranial tumor first. And for Shivanoma, I think the radiation therapy is very effective. So uh, I think we do not have to be too aggressive in uh, removing the uh, extra portion of the tumor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would use the uh, interoperative monitorings. Um, we monitor the vagal nerve and the hypogrossal nerve, but uh, I think the hypogrossal nerve is not likely to respond interoperatively. And uh, I believe that uh, it will not uh, re recover after surgery. Anyway, that's uh, probably my perspective. Yeah, yeah, Sami, I know you uh, you want to talk. You have a lot of experience with this condylar lesions. Yeah, I mean, I think the first question is, he's a young patient. That's one, two, is functional threat and mass effect of this and evidence of growth. So... We, I mean, do we have evidence of progression of this? Dr. Moro, is it growing? Clinically, uh, we've just seen him in the clinic twice, so, and it's just come recently, so we'll not be able to assess clinically how the progression is, and this is just the, the first image you've had, so radiologically, yeah. we'll not be able to 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 know how. What is what to be the progression of the lesion? We don't yeah. have any reference images. Yeah, because that's benign he's tumor. Young, right? And he's young, he's 28, right? Right. It's a benign tumor, and we're gonna like really look at the goal of surgery here if we're gonna be radical, because the tumor is not causing mass effect. The hypoglossal, like Oya said, you know, it's not or Soichi is not gonna come back. So there is no like goal of improvement of function here, then the second goal would be, okay, there mass effect, there is no mass effect of this. So if we're gonna go after it surgically because he's young, then we're gonna, he's gonna purchase fusion, occipital cervical fusion, which is for the young person is not gonna be a good option. If we're gonna do half resection, half radiosurgery, then at his young age, 
an absence of mass effect, why don't you think of radiosurgery up front and avoid the uh, cranial cervical fusion? Because you're going to have to take the occipital condyle to get to the <clears throat> extra cranial component. But if we think of half and half, I don't think, you know, when you go, when we go and do far lateral and just keep the condyle and the occipital, Atlanta occipital joint and take only the intracranial component, then back to radiosurgery. So I think radiosurgery would be probably an option versus surveillance. Um, if we if we have progression or failure of that, then I would do the transcondylar and fusion. So Linda, what do you think about radiation without even um, sampling this? What, what are your thoughts? Because I know you, you have a lot of work on meningiomas mm -hmm. that I know you don't have a lot of uh, admiration of empirical radiation. So what do you think? Well, I think to um, Dr. Youssef's point, the question is the indications for treatment. And this young man, uh, my sense is that the hypoglossal, you know, as everyone has said, will not come back, but he has progressive neck pain, um, if I recall from the history. And that neck pain for these condylar lesions um, can be quite debilitating for at least those patients I've encountered and also beginning of hoarseness. So I think the indication for treatment in this case would be to prevent further decline or any decline of cranial nerves 10 and 11, because the 12 is, is a foregone issue. Um, so if that is the concern, then I would not favor radiation up front because then that will put 10 and 11 at further risk. Um, it's probably encroached if he's already having neck pain and a little bit of hoarseness. Mm -hmm. Did he have nine and 10? I didn't catch that part. I think in the history, they mentioned some hoarseness. Is that right, Dr. Amaro? Yes, he had hoarseness, but uh, clinically, the, the nerves are okay. Okay. Well, what I think what I will translate from our opinion, I think for your last question, I think uh, it's unanimous here that I, I don't think any of the panelists here will try to do any nerve reconstruction. I think that's, uh, we're going to answer you from, be from below up. I think uh, that is a consensus that uh, when a hypoglossal nerve is causing tongue atro atrophy, you know, it, there's, I, I'm not aware of any uh, type of uh, nerve reconstruction that to try to bring that back. Um, usually we, we would uh, remove the tumor and consider that that nerve is already impaired. And, uh, you know, if you go intracranially, the 12 nerve has multiple small little rootlets. And it's not that you have a bundle like to really reconstruct. And when these tumors start in the canal area, it basically destroy the nerve. So there's not really a way to to bring that back. And um, and I'm not aware of bringing like we do for facial nerve, like try to bring uh, energy from the other side. I think we we'll end up causing atrophy on the other side. So um, people just learn how to adapt with that atrophy in one side of the, the tongue. Um, but in terms of uh, here, let's see, David, uh, South Africa, they're like, uh, you got this patient uh, or what would you do? Let's say Dr. Omoro sent it from Kenya to South Africa. Do you have anything different to offer there or better patient to stay in Kenya? <laughs> Sounds like Dr. Omoro has got everything we have in, in South Africa in terms of all the tools. Um, but I think in our environment, you, you really have uh, often very little opportunity to intervene on patients like this. So surgery often is a situation where you give them uh, a, a once off solution as best as possible because uh, losing patients to follow up is, is quite a common issue. Um, my impression having looked at this was that uh, surgical intervention uh, would, would be something that uh, I would have offered. I would have uh, liked to have seen CT scans and particularly uh, CT skull base, uh, bony windows um, to see the extent of the destruction of, of um, that condyle. But my, my thoughts were a far lateral approach with the C1 arch removal, uh, a, a, a predominantly initiating with an intracranial debulk followed by the extracranial component doing as much of this with uh, intraoperative monitoring as possible. Um, and my suspicion was that uh, we would need to fuse C0 to 3 at, at the end of the surgery. So 
um, that uh, in terms of radio surgery, uh, to me, it looked like it was really on the margin of size wise of being effective in terms of the types of uh, lesions uh, we tend to send for radio surgery. Um, so uh, more than likely just residual would be for radiation treatment. Good. Dr. Dusik, any different thought, like uh, anything you can uh, add? Let's say uh, any uh, any role of endonase or transorbital for something in the condyle? Uh, yeah. Can you show me the coronal images, coronal MRI images? Yeah. I'm not sure if the extracranial component can be accessed with endonasia approaches, but uh, the patient complained of a sub hospital headache. So maybe the headache was caused by the instability, the cervical uh, uh, vertebral junction and uh, BB, BB junctions instability. So I think and the surgical decompression is required and followed by the radiotherapy or the radio surgery, depending on the size or locations of the, the remained tumors. I think the end, endonasia's familiar approaches may be recommended first. Of course, and far lateral approaches is, may be possible, but um, for me, the endonasia familiar approaches they first decompress the tumor, uh, tumor and also identification of the tumor itself. And then some remain for the uh, remaining tumors. I can prescribe the radio surgery or other the radio therapies. It's my recommendations. Yeah, since you brought it up, let me let me tell you. Like, um, I look at these images as well. I was thinking, you know, that the possibility of gummy endonasal versus far lateral or a variation of fishy approach, right? So when I when I look at these um, coronals there, Doctor Moro. See that component that is the condyle itself. You know, if you could see my arrow here, but that uh, that component more medial inside the condyle itself that has a, pro a projection intracranial, that you can actually approach with the far medial endonasal. Uh, yeah, exactly right there. Uh, th that component it's actually straight uh, forward there. You can reach. I would say this tumor most likely schwannoma, most likely soft. And you could uh, you can get that component. What my concern is, uh, uh, Dusik, is that if you look at the first imaging, see the projection into the cervical region. See that part, uh, it becomes um, like a negative angle. You, there is a possibility you can follow the tumor there, I would say, with using a 70 degree, or but it's not going to be easy. Not something you can go around that tumor. You can probably debulk if it's suckable or something like that but not um, the direct exposure of that extension of the hypoglossal down. So if you think that this is a hypoglossal schwannoma, if you if you actually come lateral and do a, like some sort of a fish approach, where it's like a mix of a far lateral exposing the condyle, but also extending to the neck, and you have like a neck dissection where typically you see the, 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 the hypoglossal crossing, you know, that onset there coming from the skull base, then you have access to the lower part coming from the neck. So I think uh, for this, if the idea is a more complete resection, um, I think a combination of a fish approach with a far lateral where you can actually arrive behind the condyle and then resect the tumor there and, and really get that neck dissection going that you can combine similar to what we do for jugular foramen but this is more ventral. It's almost like we, well, you know, some some people call it the extreme lateral, where you can actually come uh, and and go more anterior inside the condyle. Um, I'm not totally sure it's going to be unstable, Sami. I'm, I'm, you know, there's a very medial component of the condyle still there. I'm, I'm just not totally sure. Really, we'll need a fusion. Um, something well, that I mean, if you, I mean, he has to get like flexion extension and rule out instability, but. If yeah. this person is a stable, I would be conservative as long as possible to avoid cranial cervical fusion. Except for the cervical fusion in a 28-year-old yeah. active person is a high price for a benign tumor. This yeah. is my main concern about this lesion. And its size is small. He doesn't have deficits except the hypoglossal. <clears throat> if he has dysphagia and it's objectively proven 
by swallowing veil, that's a different story. Then we definitely need to decompress that component. But I would avoid occipital cervical fusion as much. Yeah. And I and I think the main question is if the pain is really the instability or the presence of this lesion there, right? So that's the hard part to tell. So I think we're all in agreement here, Dr. Moro, that some observation is not going to hurt. I think uh, there's no mass effect on the brain stem, and the nerve that is compromised is already compromised. So I think that is we're all in agreement. Repeating an image here and there is not going to hurt. Take your time before uh, resecting this. I, I guess that's uh, any anyone on the panel would disagree with that. Would would say that surgery should be done so right away. Anyone? Yeah, I think the stereotactic radio surgery should be done before because remodeling will happen and the joint will become more and more thinner for his long-term outcome. We are very sure it's a 12th nerve schwannoma because it has, the symptoms have started with atrophy of the tongue as cell itself. So what we need to do is address radiosurgically because any approach you take, you're going to take it out partially and having an instability or causing a surgery which is going to cause instability for a young man is a very heavy price to pay. So your 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 advice, uh, Sadir, will be radio radio surgery or radiotherapy empirically. No, radio surgery, cyber knife, gamma knife, whatever it is. So Dr. one Omar, of these things. Have... Do you have those there uh, in Kenya? Yeah, available? yeah, we do. For these patients, you will do just a cyber knife. Uh, in fact, and you don't need to even fraction it because it is away from the brainstem. So we will be just doing cyber knife for these patients. Dr. Omoro, do you have those available in Kenya? Yes, yes. We have one, one cyber knife center. Yeah. What do you think, Linda? I'll go back to you because I tend, 28 year old, I try to avoid radiation in these people. Like, uh, and I, and I guess I'm more aggressive uh, with the thoughts yeah. of taking it out in a 28-year-old. What do you think? Uh, the, I think your, your... those are two yeah. interesting points that have been expressed by many. Number one, the assumption that there will be residual tumor, and number two, um, the you know the dis which is very interesting. Uh, number two, the discussion of instability. Because uh, as you all have said, this tumor has already expanded the hypoglossal canal. So in a transcondylar approach coming from um, laterally, the bone that's taken, you know, will is lateral to this. And I agree uh, for, for a tumor of modest size, which is this, they're very well. I have not yet fused any one of these hypoglossal tumors of this size or, or larger. And they seem to do okay, at, at least at a couple of years out. Um, so I agree that that teasing apart what the origin of that pain is from. And even considering if you needed to uh, fusion down the line, but it may not be necessary. Uh, just setting the CT scan and depending on how much of the actual joint is uh, preserved uh, as number one. But in terms of the um, resection, if surgery is committed for, I think the Dr. Amoro's second question would be surgical nuances, especially if this patient only has, you know, one chance to get surgery or, or if there's resources that are limited. Um, my personal preference, as you know, would be the transcondylar approach with the neck dissection. And I do think that one easy way of exposing that tip of the C1 lateral, um, C1 TP and Mm -hmm. lateral masses to follow the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid up to the mastoid tip and then just putting a finger in the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid and the other uh, above every all tissues you know from from that level onwards can be cut all muscles that is that's a fast way to get to c1 and so the neck dissection is already half done in a sense by the time you get there and um uh, uh, remove the mastoid cortex, get down to the corner and, and drill down. I find that most of these tumors have a pretty well robust sheath. So the risks of the operation comes in number one, not hurting the carotid and number two, not um, hurting the lower cranial nerves above 12, which both of which uh, I think the lower cranial nerves have a very excellent chance of being preserved here given the minimal incursion intracranially. And so following that, very expanded condyle and making the turn, including using like an angled pituitary curette 
um, usually can follow from inside of that hypoglossal schwannoma sheath downwards and, and have a very reasonable access to um, resection. So I'm not sure that having residual tumor is a necessary assumption. And if it is, it's probably just a very little bit of the caudal um, bit, which could be watched for years to decades to come. I'm very glad to hear, Linda, that the, everything you describe is like uh, what I would describe. And um, staying inside these schwannomas is the secret, you know, to avoid the, the, the other nerves usually compact around. So if you find a nice window, you can actually stay around and you can do an extra capsular inside the capsule in a way, right? You just stay inside the capsule, but do extra caps. And, and, and that's what I think is be hard to do in Donezo because of that tail and that first coronal imaging there to follow around all the way down. That Indonesia would, I would say, the residual will be a, uh, something that will happen. But with the open approach, I agree with you. I think there's a high chance to get this whole lesion out. And I think I agree with uh, David that having a CT pre-op would allow to see what is the structures of the condyle that is still there. Looking at the second coronal uh, picture that you see there, looks to me that the medial part of the condyle, uh, the articularis is still there. So it may be that it's still stable after you get this soft tumor out of there. But let's see what Sarah has to say. She uh, has her hand uh, elevated there. Uh, you know, what, what would you do different there, uh, Sarah? Sarah, I, I don't know if you're muted. I don't see you anymore. The usual, usual problem. Um, yeah. No, I think you've all said it. Um, but I think, you know, as was mentioned uh, earlier, the CT will be uh, very important and some kind of angiogram just to see exactly what your anatomy is. Um, I think that it's such a young man who's presented with a problem with such a large tumour. I think you could observe it for a little period, maybe just to get his head around such a size of an operation and to get your team together. But you have to presume that it's grown at some point from to now to be symptomatic. Most of these in our institution would all go to Gamma Knife, but in his, because he's so young and it gets up to a three and a half centimetres, our chance of primary control, I don't think, over his lifetime would be that would be that great. Um, we'd probably have to fractionate over uh, three sessions, I would think. Like everyone has said, I'd be trying to avoid the fusion in the young man if we can. Um, it's hard to know if the neck pain is due to the tumour into the uh, canal or whether it's instability, uh, but uh, I think the CT would be very helpful in knowing whether we can we can avoid that if we are looking at surgery. And I think I, I would think in such a young man that surgery would give him his best option over radiation personally, and I work in the gamma knife unit here in Australia as well. Uh, and as we've said, the schwannomas are a lot easier than some of the other some of the other tumours. Mm. Good. So, uh, Linda, there's a question for you from Joshua Witte. Um, will the pain, do you think the pain would improve if you do this more, uh, try to remove this tumor out? What, what are your thoughts related to pain? Yeah, that's a great question. I would love to, to hear all of your thoughts on that because I've had mixed success. And, you know, in some folks with these um, kind of jugular foramen hypoglossal region, the pain's gone immediately post-op. They, they still have the other cranial nerve issues, but the pain is gone. In others, um, the persistent neck pain lasts for years. So I don't have a great I, sense. I, I would say that uh, I've seen, I've done a lot of jugular foramen. Just to disclose, we do, I do here with, uh, with the ENT head and neck team. You know, like it would be nice to see Dr. Calleja's opinion on that. Um, and I see uh, exactly like you say, uh, there's a discomfort that lasts for a long time. Those jugular approaches, you know, tightness, they complain of, I uh, think uh, everything's tight uh, in the area. So we definitely bring side effects. Uh, and it's not until sometimes more than a year that they stop complaining of the discomfort that we cause with that approach. That's totally true. Um, so I agree with you. I think pain, I think we may remove one pain and give another pain. So, uh, that's why I respect the opinion of the people that want to do radiation that perhaps is better. You know, I personally don't like to give radiation to any eight year old. I tend to indicate surgery. Nobody does Danny. Nobody does want to give radiation <laughs> no, I find for, for schwannomas in the vestibular schwannomas not to radiate small and, uh, yeah. and young yeah. people, cure them, but 
This yeah. is very tricky. I mean, this, this case is, is a very tricky, tricky one. Dr. Omoro brought a case that I think it might might take the whole hour of us discussing here because uh, it was a very uh, very interesting um, very interesting case, Dr. Omoro. And Sadir has his hand elevated. I, I know you want to go ahead, Sadir. Um, no, no, it was my mistake. Sorry, it's fine. Oh, okay. But I think radio be given because uh, means if we get it through, uh, if it's a soft suckable tumor and everything comes out, mm -hmm. then it is fine. But if it doesn't, uh, it's a dural stretch headache. Most probably that's what is causing it. Radiation helps that also to a certain extent. So mm -hmm. that's why I said that radiation is a, for the 28 years old person without any instability, without morbidity, except for the tongue being gone, no other problem. Maybe radiation is the best option. We'll give that as a first option to our patients. Yeah, let's see. Claudio, are you still there, Claudio, Dr. Callejas? I am, I am. You know, I, I know in, in general, uh, I think in our practice, we as a neurosurgeons see this and we kind of uh, guide the decision making, but uh, you're frequently involved in this like a uh, a jugular for M and lesions. What what are your thoughts in terms of like particularly the approach and the um any pain that uh, that that you could could uh, you know seeing this happening? What what do you what would you say? No, I, I totally agree with you. I think that the more central part of it could be a approach with an endoscopic uh, uh, approach, mm -hmm. uh, but the more lateral part extending to the neck. Uh, unless it's sackable, it is going to be hard to reach. And I also agree with the the fact that you said that you may cure a, a pain, but add another one with the open approach. Um, so yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Yeah, and I see Dr. Romoro is presenting some of the CAT scan. I think it is really clarify a lot of our questions there. Go ahead, Dr. Romoro. Uh, I was just about to get the CT scan. So I think what's evident, the ipsilateral condyle actually actually been eroded by the lesion. Mm -hmm. But there's if you look at on the next imaging, there's a good component that's still there. The cortex is still yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, see, yeah. So I think if you can reach from behind, like Linda was describing, for the condyle, like a, I don't I don't like to say just far lateral because for this is slightly different. You have to extend it to the neck. It's more like a fish approach that you go to the to the. Talking about fish A, like a fish A exactly, like a fish A that you come come from behind, that you you uh, instead of focus on the mastoid, you actually focus on the on the uh, on the condyle for this because I don't think any mastoid work needs to be done on this one. If you look at that next it's corner, lower, yeah, it's much lower. You got to really just like a light in. Yeah. Not for the mastoid, but the mastoid chip. So the cortex that's a light in uh, yeah. for that anterior ventral condylar exposure. Yeah. But, you know, since we all talked and talked a lot here, um, I would like to hear from Dr. O Dr. Omoro, like, uh, what are your thoughts hearing everything that we said? What what, do you, what is your take so far? So, so far, I think uh, we discussed the role of conservative management as we try and follow up the patient neurologically as well as radiologically, just to assess if we have progression of symptomatology. Mm -hmm. uh, two, because of the, we already have lost the psilateral uh, hypoglossal nerve, then there's really no big role for reconstruction, but then as we, as we continue to follow up, we'll be able to monitor the, the carrier nerve uh, mm -hmm. 9 and 10, eh? as well as 11, yeah. So in terms of if we're going to opt for surgery, then I think what we discussed as a the far lateral approach from posterior mm -hmm. would be would be suffice to resect the lesion. We'll be able to stay within the lesion uh, as, and just so that we don't get to damage other cranial nerves that are close by. Mm -hmm. I think we don't need also need to fuse the patient because uh the, the, the risk, the comorbid effects that we'll get for the young patient mm -hmm. due to the fusion as, uh, as opposed to just resecting the lesion and not fusing the, the spine. Yeah. I well, the main okay. I would add on that, probably you should, uh, like, let's say successful surgery, then you need to do flex extensions and analyze to see 
if there'll be a need or not. But uh, I think there's a high chance that you will not need to do a few. Okay. Very, very good. So to conclude here, the Dr. Wuti uh, uh, from uh, from Thailand, uh, are you available? Are you? Can you uh, give your opinion, Wuti, on this case or? Yes, uh, I would go for surgery in this case. Yeah, and try to remove as much as possible intracranial and extracranial, and try not to. I I think that maybe we we don't have to do the bilateral approach, and uh, the less of the tumor, we can see the pathology and maybe follow up, and uh, we give the radio surgery or radiotherapy. Uh, would be the the next step. We, I will not go with the radiation therapy first. I have a couple of cases like this, but uh, it's not as young as this. I do the same thing like this and then try to follow up first. Thank you. So would you just to clarify what what approach you, you would take uh, to try to get the removal? Uh, I would go for the retrosigmoid and mm. perhaps we don't don't need to to do the uh bilateral approach yeah from the oh, very so, beginning so, i see so you would start with a retrosig just to get the intracranial component and make diagnosis yes and uh um, we can we can go a little bit down i mean i mean that we we can we can see and the, the lesion in intracranial yeah and then another approach we can we can choose uh, later on, yeah, try to remove the tumor. Yeah. Yeah, I've done that as well, which, uh It's a good point because I didn't bring that up, but uh, I've done that for a young girl uh, where she had actually a much larger intracranial component. And I came at uh, Retrosig, remove all the intracranial component, left disease in the scobes and distal in the neck, and observe, I think, for seven years. And then eventually it was growing again. And then I came with a more uh, type of fichet approach and remove the tumor from outside. So I agree with that. You could stage in time as well. That's a good advice, Dr. Romoro. And I, I, what I like about that is if you have pathology instead of just if you one day decide for radiation, you you have pathology, you know what you're doing. I, I never like much to give empirical radiation without any specimen. So I think that is a is a something in between that Dr. Butpong uh, from Thailand that uh, brought up like uh, any any other comment just the cat scan confirms the benign nature of this and it's not eroding it's expanding the condyle so mm -hmm. that I think is another proof of this being a benign schwannoma just we have to think about the pathology that we're dealing with a benign very very slowly progressive pathology so whether yeah. us would be or the tumor, we don't want to be worse than the tumor for sure. So that's just a basic, like general principle. Yeah. So Dr. Romoro, I'll go back to you. Like any other questions specifically you have for the panel? Because I don't think we have time for any other case. Your case was outstanding. And we don't have to stay to complete the hour here. If you if you have any other question or uh, to clarify, this is your time. Uh, I think I think I've had this uh good discussion and uh, I don't have any other question to ask. Thank you so much. Danny, I can show the case that I sent you the other day quickly. Please go ahead, yeah. Let's we see. can uh, debate in pulled, 12 minutes. I pulled a few things quickly because I think it's a good thing to discuss. Okay. Share screen. You see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, this is a challenge one that you, you, you showed to me. Yeah, this is a 24-year-old, and he presented with basically symptomatic hydrocephalus. You can see the temporal horns, and you can see the beginning of this lesion here. So that's T1 without contrast. Of course, I couldn't pull the entire things I did just now. You see something multi-cystic heterogeneous from front to back of the third ventricle and on the coronal post contrast you see it going up here and this is probably the money shot here mm -hmm. so there is no question that 
this is not really surgery, <laughs> this is surgical. Um, and the question would be that I shared with Danny two days ago, what would be the approach for this? Just quick, quick question. Uh, did you treat the hydrocephalus already or no? So I put an EVD. Okay. Yeah, I put an EVD. He came transferred from a different hospital and mm -hmm. um, put the EVD, then we were deliberating about the approach. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just bring a bring a, if you show that sagittal again. Uh, it, it, well, this this axle also you see the chiasma is anterior to the lesion right there, yeah. and the sagittal you can see if you there right there. So how is basically pushed forward, and uh, I always look at that as one of the first things for any lesion in the supracellar or third ventricle um, coming in the nasal. You kind of blocked. Uh, there's no window uh, above that gland, and you can yeah, see. Yeah, you see mm -hmm. here, it's just yeah, chiasm somewhere exactly where our arrow is there. So there's no really opportunity to come in on azo safely, in my opinion. And, and pituitary function is uh, is it there or is it gone? Yeah, he has intact pituitary functions. Yeah, exactly. So I already gave that some in my opinion. So anyone would like to uh, talk about? Linda, what do you think? I think it looks um, set up and favorable for uh, for me a um, interhemispheric transcolosal approach, um, expanding the foramen of Monroe. I would get a CTV to see if there's a more famous. You know, the craniotomy is right sided for me for right for many reasons. That's, that's what um, I did the night before. Yeah. Yeah, and then the you know the venous angle sometimes favors uh, more one side versus the other side more in terms of the actual which frame and to come to i like the interhemispheric approach because or the transcolosal approach because since that obstructive hydrocephalus is an issue then you can do the septostomy and at least fenestrate the two sides depending on the final pathology they're they're um you know hopefully it's a cranial frangioma but in some other pathologies there is still a chance of communicating hydrocephalus even after the tumor resection down the line just from having a intraventricular lesion so then it at least allows for a unilateral shunt if they ever needed it down the line um having the septum open and, and being able to have easy access to either side um, for the frame of Monroe sometimes just expanding that and with a very uh, venous angle, I think this this whole tumor could come out just through that, or if not, then opening the choroidal fissure to expand the posterior access. So yeah. you're you're recommending transchoroidal, not transforaminal. Depending, depending on the venous angle. So I, I always start with transforaminal as um and you know coagulate the choroid plexus there, open it up as much as I can, especially if one side has a more favorable venous angle there, but uh, if you can't reach back, which I think sometimes with the tumor capsule and the cyst capsule, it all involutes hand over hand without having to open up the choroidal. Um, uh, what the what would be the differential diagnosis of this? It's going anterior and posterior third ventricle. Yeah. And not much enhancement. If you think a 24-year-old, you would be hoping for one of those germinomatous tumors, but it doesn't look like it. Mm -hmm. Do you have a T2? Is there a sharp playing on the T2 by chance? Well, we have the T2. I just didn't pull it up here. It looks also like you know, ISO intense on the T2. Sarah, do you uh, you want to mention something? Yeah, I just wondered um a, a CT with the, any calcification because I think like Linda, I looked at thought it was a primary intraventricular uh, craniopharyngioma probably. I think I would try first up doing an endoscopic uh, biopsy just to see what we're dealing with. I've just recently acquired um, a little ultrasonic aspirator that goes down an endoscope, and I would like to try that first. If it's something that we should completely reset, but um, it just depends, I think, initially on the biopsy uh, results and BRAF status and other things. Yeah, what are the thoughts of the panel of this could be a, like a... Astrocytoma it could be like uh, you know coming from the hypothalamus or from the uh, like optic glioma something like that. I think I always consider that with this this type of lesion here, like uh, you know, it's filling up the whole third ventricle, which is very unusual for a craniopharyngioma. Some of these, I guess, is top of the list craniopharyngioma, but uh, 
the fact that it's not enhancing much and behaving a little bit intrinsic to my opinion there what is no calcium there is no calcium no calcium not yeah and another in opinion, yeah in my opinion this is not the typical finding of cranial pharyngomas maybe astrocytoma or optic or yeah that's that's my uh, hypothalamic hematomas were it depends on so we need the first biopsies and depending on the biopsy yeah we have to choose the total resections or observations or follow i think yeah. It may not be a bad way to start something like uh, leave it the big surgery for once you have diagnosed, maybe come endoscopically like Sarah and, and do seek care mentioning, more like a biopsy transmon row to start, maybe not a bad idea. And you can do a septation at that time, like Linda brought up, you could do it. Yeah. Uh, the, other, the other thing that I thought of that I kind of regressed from that or changed my mind is to come interhemispheric subcalosal translaminate terminalis, but that would give you a narrow corridor to the back part. Yeah, yeah. I think the idea, like Linda said, is transcalosal, interhemispheric, and transcoroidal. And More depending lot. on the veins, you can tailor how much you open the choroidal fissure, like Linda said. And that will give more front-to-back exposure of that third ventricle. Yeah, yeah. So you have an EVD there. Is the EVD just draining one side or is draining both sides? Like a Both sides. So there is probably natural fenestration given okay. all this mm -hmm. yeah. size yeah. that the, the septum is already, is already because two mm -hmm. ventricles are drained. It's a good point then. Yeah, no, but you, you're totally right. It's frequent that we go there and then the septum is already gone from showing that yeah. it's really chronic. Yeah. Yeah. But I favor, yeah, I favor something from those glial tumors. Yeah, I think so. I think, and then the question is, like, how much of that can you take? And sometimes they are jello and very different than the, the parenchyma. And you can go with the suction slowly there and kind of uh, the bulk with that. If and it's I, coming from the thalamus or it's coming from the hypothalamus, then it will be the maximum safe resection probably. Yeah, yeah. I agree, and uh, but I, I one thing that Sarah brought up, um, I typically don't feel comfortable putting uh, those any like either aspirator cutter device or the or the ultrasonic aspirator through the channel of an endoscopic channel way. Um, but that's me. I prefer to have that more control there. Um, you know, usually if I'm thinking to do something like that, the other option is a transcortical like a port approach that you can work through the port, like a, through a little cylinder. That's another option too. I've done a transport transcoroidal approach. Uh, the main limitation is ipsilateral hypothalamus. Mm -hmm. And then over time, I do like Linda, I'm favoring more and more coming transcalosal on this if I'm trying to resect, because you can go on both sides of the- Yeah, of the, gives yeah, you larger yeah. access. Yeah, can, once you're committed with a, with a, with a transcortical with tube or with a speculum or or with the retractors, then the ipsilateral down here is a difficult, and also uh, you don't have a good view of the frontal monroe on the other yeah. side. And coming from yeah. the top, you can actually look on both sides. So the transcarose and this this colosso is already so thinned up. So I will. And the CTV was great. And there is no limitations. Why? And if you look at you know travel less through the brain. Is yeah. no, there is nothing here down to the yeah. tumor. Transcortical yeah. is still splitting white matter and getting down, and you have to enlarge that to get wider exposure. Yeah. I think the transcolossal is the best here. Yeah, but uh, right. but but think about uh, Samia, what Sarah mentioned. It may not be a bad idea if you have this patient there with the EVD. Just go down with the endoscope, at least to sample. And, the biopsy? Yeah, biopsy beforehand. Then you know if you're dealing with a glioma, you can discuss in tumor board, uh, you know. Um, question is, how long can you leave the EVD there, like, uh, you know, and, and keep, you know, waiting? No, I mean, this would be within a couple of days. So, yeah. Uh, I'm, I might, like, do the transcalosal, take biopsy first before splitting the choroidal fissure mm -hmm. from here. Yeah and see the frozen and which direction to go, then proceed. So that will be something. What if, they, what if they tell you is craniopharyngioma, you would tend to keep going, right? 
and keep going. If it's a glioma, I would also resect as much. Yes, then, then it, but you know more about it. Yeah, I agree with that plan. If it's a germinoma, which I don't think it is, then we're done. Right, right. Okay. Danny, can I ask if you're going to put them, uh, like I use those vicor ports too, where would you put it into uh, transcortical to what would be your trajectory to it? Or when I do the, the port? Yeah. Um, I come a little more closer to midline then. So normally you do three centimeters uh, for put an EVD. I tend to be more, a little closer, like uh, to try to get, get down. So it would around two centimeter, a little, almost like uh, you're doing a third ventriculostomy. It's a little closer yeah. to midline to avoid that two lateral angle. Um, but it's, yeah, and the other thing like is, uh, uh, it's slightly more posterior as well. Um, if you need to work mm. on the third ventricle, what happens is you got to be careful because usually it's at the coronal suture. If you go to anterior and you put a port, your angle is from anterior to posterior in the in the uh, forum of Monroe, and you only see posterior, mm. you, you have limitation to go anterior in the third ventricle. This lesion has a lot of component posterior, so but that's the planning that you have to take in consideration. See, if you come, if you come a uh, two. <laughs> Posterior, usually the, the fornix is a limitation to go anterior, but in this case, you, you may actually plan here. In this case, might be uh, you'll be at two centimeters in front of the corona exactly to get an angle from anterior to posterior to the foramen there. And and you can open the choroid fissure through that approach as well. Yeah. But but uh, as you dissect the same way, as microscopy, you have two hands on the thing with the microscope. I used to put an endoscope in those cases, and I change it to... Just use the microscope, and you and you can change the angle progressively if you look uh, more anterior, more posterior. But again, uh, for these large third ventricle tumors, the main limitation is is the ipsilateral wall and uh, controlling the frame row on the other side. So I I kind of more and more doing transcalosa for this. Mm. Yeah. Excellent. I think we're uh, on top of the hour here, Sami. Yep. Thank you for bringing yeah. this up. Good luck. Keep Thank us you. posted. Yeah, send a message in the in our you know chain of e messages there that we have uh, updating us uh, on how this patient does. And uh, Dr. Omoro, if you're still there, thank you so much again, uh, Jeremy, for uh, your participation. It was really uh, uh, you know important for us as well to understand your uh, reality there and uh, all you have available. And we're all impressed with actually the size of your program and the the the, the fact that you have a lot of uh, the same things that we have available for you there. So we, we really was very interesting to see and very interesting case. Uh, appreciate. And also please keep us posted in what you guys are going to do and how this 28 uh, year old gentleman is going to do in the future. Please keep us posted uh, as well. Thanks so Thank much. So much. And I mean, appreciate everyone's uh, participation. We'll uh, update and upload the, uh, video of this uh, in the uh, YouTube channel as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.